Hello everyone, Jono here, back again with another single type challenge run. Picking up from our last playthrough, we successfully beat the game using a dinosaur only deck, so let's go ahead and tick that off the list. I asked you all to comment the next type you wanted to see for my next run, and I had a feeling you Satus wanted to subject me to this. The type you've chosen for me is the Sea Serpent Monster type. All in all, there are a total of 5 Sea Serpent Monster cards in the entire game, with zero being made available to the player in the starting deck. Wait, Zero, is this a joke? How the hell do you expect me to start this run? Nah, I'm giving up. What the hell? What do you expect me to do? Uh, I think I'll take things over from here while Jono cools off. To recap the rules, the main blockers seem to be Rule 1 and 4, which mandate that we have a single type deck before we can proceed with the game. But I can see two ways around this, so turn that music back on and let's run through our options. Option 1 involves bending our first rule ever so slightly. In Free Duel, we have the option of challenging Duel Master K over and over again until we accumulate enough start chips to buy our first card. On a technicality, we haven't started the challenge since the gameplay begins when we face Simon. However, there are grounds to be argued that the run has failed since we had to use a non-Sea Serpent deck to farm star chips. This leaves us with option two. Play the Japanese version of the game and obtain our Sea Serpent cards via a pocket station. Simple, right? I'll let Jono explain the rest now that he's cooled off. Cooled off is a bit of a stretch. This is what option two actually means for me here in Skippy Land Australia, which is why I think you guys intentionally did this to me. For option two to work, I'll need to purchase a Japanese PS1 and a Japanese copy of the game, buy either a PAL to NTSC converter or a TV from America, bid and win a pocket station from an eBay auction, and waste my lunch breaks learning Japanese on Duolingo. All up, that equates to 430 Australian dollar dues, which converts to 276 US freedom bucks or 375 Canadian eh. With my wallet now flatter than the ass of a white girl and our mind fluent in weeaboo, this is where the fun begins. We convert our TV to use the American NTSC resolution and boot up our Japanese game on our Japanese system with our pocket station inserted. Scroll down to the options and select download software. This will install the Yu-Gi-Oh game to our pocket station. After I remember to insert my memory card. Boot the app up and select transfer and pick the third option. This lets us obtain a random card via infrared. You now need to locate every single TV remote you have in your house and put this pocket station in a bit of a questionable position. Hitting every button press on your remote, you have an amazing 5 in 722 chance of landing one copy of a sea serpent monster, which in our case will spike Cedra. You can choose to either subject yourself to more headache to farm the other 4 cards, or we can start the game with just this. To reorient ourselves to something comprehensible, I've dumped the save data onto a modded PS2 and converted it back to an English version of the game so we can understand what the hell is actually being said to us. Taking 5 minutes to set up our main deck, we're now ready to start this run. Taking some feedback from our last run, I've increased the speed of our clips from 200% to 300% because we are sure as heck gonna need it for this run, trust me. Kicking things off, we have our first duel against the blue cocoon of evolution. Welcome to playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories with only 3 monster cards. As you can tell from the starting hand, we're required to churn through our entire deck until we find one of 3 spike cedras. Oh well. To keep ourselves entertained, I'm now learning that we have certain equipped cards that can fuse together to make rituals which are absolutely useless to us, so you know, hooray for that. Simon whips out a fusion, but luckily we draw into a monster card after exhausting 20 cards. From this point on, the duel is a cakewalk. Simon won't fuse into anything further unless he leaves it on the field, so we don't really need to worry about him whipping out anything too powerful to take out our Spike Cedra. On top of that, almost every equip card in this deck I have is compatible with it, because we're going to be sticking with this guy for a while, so you know, get used to seeing him. Anywho, trusty Raigeki for the win, and we get... Amoeba. That's Simon down, and now we slide down to the Duel Grounds, where we decide to throw down the gauntlet with Tina. Do you like blue field spells? I do. They're my favourite. If not, you better get used to it, because you're going to be seeing them a lot. Anyway, we brick our first hand. Seems to be a common theme. I wonder how many bricks we'll get before we're able to construct the labyrinth frickin' wall. Anywho, we somehow angered the AI that's controlling Tina. No idea what we've done, might be post-trauma from the previous duel we had with her, but she decides to whip out a frickin' pumpkin the King of Ghosts on us. Seriously, this game really throws a middle finger to new players. 
This is the literal first duel of the game, so I don't know what they are expecting a new player to do against this. But luckily, we pull up a Spike Seedra, which gets a nice boost from our Umi, which lets us attack over a Pumpkin, and we proceed to wreck everything she throws at us in Retribution for that. Thankfully, there's no shenanigans that Tina can really throw at us. We attack Karibo, we whittle down her life points, and by the next turn, we've won the game. Oh, look at that, Raigeki for the win. Love it. Da -da 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 -da, we get a Dancing Elf, just the one. On to Villager 1. Luck smiles upon the Brave, which is a really weird way of me saying that I fluked getting a monster card on turn 1. Since we have something actually defending us, Villager 1 is basically a cakewalk, especially with the power boost we've been able to give our Spike Seedra. Despite all this, I still decide to change the field to C, because I like blue, like I said. Anyways, Raigeki, not for the win, just for the ha-has. We wait for his next monster, which is basically nothing. I get a bit complacent this duel, and end up using more turns than I needed to, because I was torn between whether I wanted to boost up Spike Seedra to the maximum amount of possible, or whether I should just, you know, beat him down and just get on with the playthrough. My math has not improved, by the way. I've left him with 300 life points thinking I was strong enough. But anyways, Raigeki for the win, and we get a key mace. And that is Villager 1 down, on to Villager 2. Keeping up with our fantastic momentum, we start our duel off against Villager 2, and we brick in hand 1. This is not good. He punishes us by fusing into a Queen of Autumn Leaves. And we brick hand 2. Not good. <laughs> so how does it respond? He throws down something that's actually powered up by our Umi. That's not good. We brick hand three. And if my math has finally decided to, you know, fix itself, we lose. Yep, we lost to Villager 2. And you know what else is fun? I forgot to save my game. Guess who has to do all this all over again? Thanks to the power of editing, we play through and jump cut our way all the way back to Villager 2. And we try again for round two. Only this time, we're going to try not suck. Yeah, we'll see how we go on that one. Yay! Breaking on turn one. <laughs> you know we're off to a stellar start with that one. Please just don't kill us. Oh, Dragon Zombie, that's neat. We break turn two. Things are starting to look like the... <laughs> oh no, please stop. <laughs> stop. Oh, Dark Hole, just save me. I am not having a good time here. Sorry, let me lean back from the mic. That's a bit loud. Oh great, he summons something that's getting powered up by our field spell. Raigeki, please save us because this is the last turn and I'm likely going to lose. Finally, we get a monster card. And at this point, I don't think we're going to have a problem unless he decides to fuse into something that we're not going to like. I'm not taking chances, I'm going to beef this thing up to the absolute maximum and just start whittling away at this guy. <laughs> this is like the second or third duel of the game and I'm already having this much trouble. So, you know, yay for that. Anywho, trusty Raigeki for the win, and we get da -da 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 -da, a one-eyed chill dragon. There we go, on to Villager 3. What starts with a B and rhymes with Frick? That's right, it's Brick. And to no surprise to us, we've gotten really good at that. For those of you wondering how long it's going to take until we get our next card, I have two answers to this. To farm enough star chips, assuming we'll always get an A rank, We'll need 28 duels, else we have the very short wait all the way till Banded Keith before we're even able to get a second card. And guess what? It's going to be weaker than Spike Cedra. So yeah, enjoy that. Anyways, my rambling has awarded us with our first monster card of the duel. This is handy. We're going to need it. Thankfully, there's nothing really Villager 3 can throw at us um, because whatever Thunder Monster he'll fuse into will still be weaker than Spike Seedra. That is unless, you know, the AI decides to flip us a bird and fuse into Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon, which he can do. But thankfully, it's Raigeki for the win, and we're done with this guy. Da -da 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 -da, we win Zaragon, whatever the heck that is. Anyways, it's about that time again where we're mandated to go outside. It's a good thing the circus is in town, because we're reintroduced again to our favorite clown, Jono. And of course, his antagonistic sideshow, Prince Seto. Oh, by the way, our character's name is 123456 because I didn't want to break the game while trying to convert our Japanese save game to English. Scared of my misfortune, I decided to save my game before jumping back into the duel arena against Jono. Sorry guys, at 300% speed up, I haven't got enough frames for another Siggy butt brain voice. Don't worry, I'll find a way to sneak one in somewhere. Anywho, onto the duel with Jono. 
Luck is finally in our favor and we don't brick for the first time in this game. Hooray, I expect that to last a full single duel. Anyways, Raigeki, we get a lot of those. We've been fairly lucky <laughs> this time round. Another Spike Cedra, yep, that's game. Waffling on so I can waste down another turn. Jono throws nothing at us. We throw a Raigeki for the win and attack for game. Da -da 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 -da, we win the Fire Reaper. With Jono down, Sideshow Seto swaggers on scene, ready to serve us up a spanking, and we are not allowed to disappoint. So immediately disappointing Seto by bricking in our first hand, he's not too thrilled. <laughs> he smacks us with 1800 life points. Guess I deserve that one. We recoup with a dark hole, and he clearly wasn't done with us, because old mate decides to fuse into another 1800 attack beater, and takes it straight to our life points again for 1800. Things are not looking good, but thankfully we draw into a Spike Cedra. This was easily going to snowball into another loss for us, and it's starting to get painfully clear that I'm going to have a bad time for all the matches ahead, especially in the World Tournament, and I'm completely dreading the Final Six. Like I said, we have to survive all the way up until Bandit Keith before we're able to get another card. Anywho, not wanting to take chances, I boost up Spike Cedra to whatever attack points I can get, because I don't see myself drawing another one anytime soon. And he draws another one. Anyways, Jono being bad at math, I'm short by 600 life points. That's okay, we're done turn two with a Raigeki for the win. MVP. And we get Bladefly. Mm. With Seto defeated, we are rewarded yet again with the ability to go outside. Forgetting to save my game, I skip right ahead to the palace and ponder why this bloke is the only blue person in this game. Commotion occurs and we walk outside to see that Jafar has turned the palace into a rave with his magic disco stick. Within our VIP room, the Club Candy calls security on us for not paying our bar tab, so we arc up and decide to settle the bill outside. Cashing in some collateral with our local dealer, we pay the remaining balance and we leg it. DJ Jazzy Jafar is arguably pissed at us for interrupting his set, so he challenges us to a duel. Just for the ha-has, I wanted to see if I could beat him with my current deck. And surprisingly, it's a yes. I won't bore you with too much of the details, but we draw enough monsters to have a pretty strong starting turn, and I'm able to power up Spike Cedra to be stronger than anything you can throw at us. So I'll skip to the ending scene, and then jump back into this duel for our scripted loss. And of course it was Raigeki for the win. Would you expect anything less? Da -da 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 and we got Pumpkin. That's pretty good. Anyways, gotta jump back into the action, so I'll just jump cut ahead to us losing and progressing with the story. There we go. Time paradox avoided, everything's where it should be, and we lose. Winner, Haishin. Anyways, a blue healer dealer jumps the DJ and begs us to shatter his box. So we do. Back in the staircase dimension, we say goodbye to this blue yabby and fast forward ourselves back to the present. Hooray, yeah, we're having a tournament. Blah, 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 blah. Please let me save my darn game. Anyways, you know what happens. Have to ramble on till we get to Taya, who lets us save our game. Oh, hey, it's raining. It's not nice. To address some of the comments in my last video, there was a bit of interest in my heavy use of Raigekis in these runs. Though for the final six, I'll call it an absolute staple, we shouldn't need it for the start of this game. So we're gonna kick those out and have our next tool against Rex. How bad could it be? Also, why am I yelling? Let me move closer to the microphone, one second. All right, back once again with a Renegade Master. We're in for a battle with this ill behavior. We're powering up our Spike Cedar to take out Rex. There honestly isn't much to say. At this early on in the game, the opponents we're facing aren't too difficult. At least one power up on our Spike Cedra should be enough to run over the top of them. But hey, happy to be proven wrong. Well, not happy, I just will be. You may have noticed that this duel is taking a little bit longer than usual. That's because without the Raigekis, I need to wait for a second Spike Cedra before I can actually start damaging his life points. You know, making our already long duel even longer. So as a quality of life change, I think I need to put them back in. And it's not like I'm cheating. They're available to you in the starting deck. You can have these all three of them well before Taya, like what we did. So I think after this duel, we'll slot them back in. Anyways, I'm waffling on to fill up time. We fortunately land our second Spike Cedra, and we can finally start dealing some damage to this guy's life points. 6,100 is a really nice boost. Ah, oh, there we go, there's number three. Three Spike Cedras, and that's down for Rex. Da -da 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 we get the Dredek. I can't pronounce that card. I don't think anyone can. I think it's the Dredek. Or the Dredek. Who knows? I might call it Dr. Deck. 
Anyways, we edit our deck to put back the Ragekis, and we kickstart our next duel against Weevil. We're up against Mr. Perfectly Ultimate Great Bunghole. I will acknowledge that a lot of you wanted me to play Insects for this run. Your comments did not go unnoticed. I just needed more prep work for that playthrough, as I'm planning to showcase to you all just how busted an insect run can be if you have access to the right tools. Quite honestly, I probably might end up making two decks and making two playthroughs of that. We'll see, so stay tuned. I will say that it will be my next video. Anyways, old mate had us on the ropes for the first half of this duel, I'm not gonna lie. He does have access to almost every insect card in his drop table, so when we eventually get back to this run for insects, he is going to be the primary person we're going to be farming off, so guess we better get used to this field. I will say that we still need to watch out for Jirai Gumo, but at this point I get my second Spike Cedra, and we are well on our way to victory. Happy days for that one. I could have made this run easier for myself if I had farmed for more cards on the pocket station, but hey. Not needed. We beat him and we get da -da 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 -da, a Fiend Reflection number 2. Saving our game as always, and we're on to the next duel. Up next we have Mai, who after some googling I found out was also 24 years old during Duelist Kingdom. So there's another fun fact for you. She was also a casino card dealer in the Yu-Gi-Oh! Season 0 manga, so that's also neat. I'm rambling with the trivia because we ended up drawing a monster card on our second turn, which basically trivializes the rest of this duel. She doesn't really have much to throw at us. Our hand is also stacked very heavily with Raigekis. And you know what we like to do with Raigekis? That's right, we like to use them. Having two of them, I think I can attack for game after boosting up Spike Seedra. So let's just wait and see if my math is correct in the next turn. So here's Raigeki 1. Boom. Nothing she can do. And here's Raigeki 2 for the win. Love it. Can you beat Yu-Gi-Oh for a bit of memories with Raigeki? Yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you freaking can. Safety save. And we're on to Banded Keith. Now, Banded Keith, I thought, dropped our next Sea Serpent card, but I was incorrect. He does have a Sea Serpent card in his deck, but he doesn't drop it. Turns out the card that I was looking for is only obtained via card password. So that's going to be fun. I would need to farm 140 star chips just so I can unlock it. And I think currently we are at 55. So yeah, a lot of groaning is going to be needed later. Anywho, rambling because we drew a Spike Cedra early on. And yeah, no sneakiness on his side. We start pulverizing him for the win. By the way, speaking of cards, the next card drop is all the way up at Motion Mage. So <laughs> expect to see this same deck for a good while. Oh uh, yeah, we won Crass Clown. Neat. Let's Bandit Keith down. And we're on to our next opponent. Well, actually, no. We're on to a cutscene. Fun stuff right here. Psst. Hey, kid. You want to see something cool? Put your hand right here. And I'll show you something real neat. Yeah, that was creepy. I don't know why I did that. Anyways, we warp ourselves back to the staircase dimension. Get some cards from our past self. Warp back to reality. Look, it's gravity. No, it's shaddy. He's all maddy because we're a baddie. Staring at us like a tail daddy. And it's on to the next door. Getting ready to confront Shardy, I'm reminded of some words of encouragement from my past self. Shardy is an absolute pushover of a duelist. There is nothing in this deck that can really devastate you. If you lose to Shardy, you suck at this game, and you need to start again from the start, or just return it. I've skipped ahead a few turns, because things are looking dicey, and the music change is indicating that something bad is going to happen. But what could possibly happen? I've got some pretty solid Spike Cedras. He's not going to take my life points down to zero. So what's the problem here, people? I'm not seeing it. Anyways, for those of you astute, I think you realize what I've done. I've taken out myself. I technically did not lose to Shardy, I lost to myself. So I'm not going to restart this game. I'm just going to go at this thing again and hope to not screw up as badly as I just did. Ah, crap. We've got to do that entire cutscene all over again. Ugh. Jump cut. Okay, back to the action. We brick on our first hand. This is not the stellar start that I was hoping for, so let's see if we can pick things up come the next turn. Shardy happens to fuse back into a mystical sand, so yeah, he's responding about as well as I thought we could. Raigeki for safety, back to him. Thankfully it's nothing too strong, back to ourselves and we thankfully get a Spike Seed draw. In our utmost infinite rage moment, um, we decide to Raigeki absolutely everything on his field. The game throwing us a bone here decide to stack our hand with at least two of them. Next turn, we win. 
Raigeki, attack, and attack, done. We get a Sinister Serpent, I'll keep that for the Reptile Run. And we steal his Ankh and his Scales. Yes, that key thing is called an Ankh. Also, why isn't Sinister Serpent a Serpent? It literally has Serpent in its name. I guess that's what makes it Sinister. Turn 1 against Yami Bakura, and I've noticed that I've gotten a little bit paranoid <laughs> with respect to what the AIs can do to me this game. That loss to Shadi has really shook me, so I'm not taking chances. If I get a Raigeki, I'm going to use it. I'm a bit neurotic that way. But look, I'm hoping to slim down on the amount of Raigekis we're using in this game. It's sort of being the key crux of my win condition, so maybe, just maybe, I'll handicap myself when I get to the Majors. I don't know, we'll just have to see. I've also been very tempted to fuse Dark Hole with Umi. For those of you that don't know, fusing a Dark Hole with an Umi makes Eternal Drought, which destroys all fish monsters on the field. Problem is, I haven't actually tested to see whether that also takes out my Spike Seed Drop. We'll have a go at that when we reach Ocean Mage, if we're lucky enough to draw it. Oh, we win Curtain of the Dark Ones, by the way. Yay. And we steal his necklace. Mine. Ring? Ne no, it's a ring. Why do they call it a ring? It's a circle. It looks like on his neck. It's a necklace. Anyways. Maximilian Pegasus, otherwise known as Pegasus J. Crawford in the Japanese version. Truthfully, his whole thing in the Duelist Kingdom arc could have probably been avoided if this guy asked nicely to borrow the Millennium items off everyone, and also asked Kyra if he can loan him his vision tech to revive his wife. I think he could have avoided the need to steal people's souls. But hey, no one's perfect. Everyone has their flaws. Stealing souls is probably Pegasus's. Pegasus's? Pegasus? I gotta come up with a plural version of his name. Anyways, back to the card game. I'm getting very surprised at the amount of ritual cards that can be obtained by simply fusing things together. Not that you're ever gonna pull off a ritual, I just think it's neat. Anyways, I get a bit complacent and cop a defensive loss, but we win next turn. Raigeki was completely unnecessary, but why not? Attack for the win, and that's game, and we get a Miyotoko. Oh, we also steal his eyeball. I wonder what that would look like to the crowd, had they seen that. They would be losing their freaking minds. Anyways, on to our next opponent, and we are up against Ishizu. That's going to be her name for this run. So, I guess lore-wise is probably the closest thing, but I digress. We brick on our first turn, and she retaliates in the harshest way. She drops a twin-headed thunder dragon on turn one. I was not expecting that, and thank goodness I had a dark hole, because that was sheer panic. Absolute clenching on my side. Fortunately, we have a Spike Cedra, and we have enough to hit over the top of Roaring Ocean Snake. I don't talk a lot about Guardian Stars, but being a Pluto is the ideal type you want to be using against her. With that being said, we are doing fairly well. I think we win this one next turn. And I will say that I haven't removed the Raigekis out of my deck yet. <laughs> I'll get to that soon. Anyways, attack for game, and that's the Shizu down, and we get Root Water. And we also steal her necklace. Mine. Sorry, love. There is no easy way to say this, but we need Kyber's Rod. We really need Kyber's Rod. Okay, innuendo aside, the starting hand is just short of enough equipped cards to hit over a Blue-Eyes White Dragon by about 400 points. So as a precaution, I set Spike Cedra to a Mercury Guardian Star, which is strong against Sun. Veterans of this game will know that Blue-Eyes White Dragon and Blue-Eyes Ultimate Dragon will always be set as a Sun Guardian Star type. You can almost predict what monster the opponent has put down based on those types, so it's always handy to know that for future playthroughs. Right now, we really didn't need any of that. We happened to get lucky, and we beat Kaiba. And we get a Ryukushin. That's neat. And we got his rod. Finally. We vaporize our ancient VIP passes and throw them across the dimensional border. Tangro snatches them up and sneaks us to the backstage entrance of the Pharaoh Festival, where we bust in and... Oh. Party's over, I guess. We say hi to Salami, who tells us that the palace and its inhabitants are no more due to the total anarchy that unfolded after DJ Jazzy Jafar closed his set at the palace rave. Wanting to know more, we gabber our way to the palace ruins, where we are forced to throw down with a blind janitor. Following in the footsteps of our future self, we brick our first hand, which is no surprise to anyone. The janitor flops out his giant red sea snake, which is somehow not a sea serpent time monster. So in our sheer anger, we dispose of it with a dark hole. He then retaliates by throwing an angry cloud at us, which has me questioning what kind of security detail is employed at this place. Anywho, bricking in turn 3, 
I'm starting to get flashbacks to my shardy fight, which is starting to get me a little bit worried. I stupidly decided to change the fill to Umi. Don't know why I did that. The top four cards of his deck are all Aqua Monsters, so I have just powered them up even more. But thankfully, we draw Spike Cedra as an out. Phew, I'm not having to go back and relive the rest of that World Tournament now, am I? The game RNG finally throws a bone at us, gives us a few Raigekis to get ourselves back on track. We've missed them. So yeah, I start blasting and attack him directly with Spike Cedra. Another few equip cards and we're good for the next two turns. Not much to say about Mage Soldier. I am very fortunate that his monsters are relatively weak. So we should be able to save our game and not have to worry about replaying anything. Right? Right past Jono? You don't forget to save your game before losing? Are you currently foreshadowing what the heck is about to happen? We book it down to the Duel Arena, eagerly wanting to save our game. Jono whisks us away to a secret spot, which can't be all that secret because it looks absolutely freaking massive. In a misclick, I decide to duel Jono. So I done goofed, so we better hope that we win this. We brick in turn 1, which you guys must be getting tired of hearing me repeat. So does Jono by the looks of things, who throws down a red eyes black dragon against us. Interestingly, when you look at his deck list, it seems to resemble his anime deck the most closely. He's got Flame Swordsman, he's got Garuzis, he's got Red Eyes, he has almost all of his anime cards, which begs the question of what they were planning to do with this deck. Either way, we're not looking too good. We have enough Dark Holes to protect us, but after one more attack, I'm done. And we're left on 200 life points. That's it, I lost. Unless he puts down a Spell and Trap card, we have wiped to Jono. Oh, that is just mean. What? That was mean. Oh. Oh, we have to go back all the way to Kyber in the World Tournament. Jump cut. I genuinely replayed the entire sequence up until this point, which must make you all glad that you're watching me do this instead of you subjecting yourselves to it. Safe to say that I'm starting to get a little bit paranoid again because I've bricked in Tan 1, but the game throws me an even bigger bone with three Raigekis. Using Guardian Stars to our advantage again, we set ourselves to a Mercury to take down his Guilty of the D-Knight. We boost ourselves up with a few more equip cards because I don't really want to have a repeat of him taking out one of my Spike Cedras. Raigeki 1, attack. Look, I'm not going to repeat the entire sequence of saying three Raigekis, but look, what can I say? We have enough to make a Lightning Vortex here. We start blasting and we win. I appreciate the handout after the run we just had. We get a Hinotama Soul. That's nice. We're going to go talk to someone else, and it's up against Tina. Tina 2 shouldn't be much of a problem for us. Her deck comprises entirely of fairy monsters, with the strongest being 1800 attack points. I believe it's Gai Katena Megami. Anyways, fairy monsters all have a Sun Guardian Star. So remembering that, we need to make sure that we set our Spike Cedrus to Mercury. Did I remember to do that? <laughs> Not in the first turn, but that's okay, we managed to redeem ourselves. Giving ourselves a few more equip cards, we're pretty much in safety territory. She doesn't have any spell or trap cards that can really disrupt us, so a few handy Raigekis and waiting till we get a second Spike Cedra is all we need to defeat her. Random fact according to Yugipedia, Taya has actually beaten Joey about 5 times off screen during the start of Duelist Kingdom. I had no idea she even knew how to play card games outside of that one interaction with Mai in Duelist Kingdom. Oh, more you know. We defeat her Shining Friendship, and there's only one attack left. With Taya out of the way, we can now save our game. Which is neat. Oh, the card we draw da -da 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 -da, is a Skull Servant, which she surprisingly has in her deck for some reason. Don't know why. Anyways, saving the game, we're going to skip back to the King's Valley and have a chat with Samkehara. After finding a map while pillaging a gravesite, casual Friday for us, this dregling decides to take us to DJ Jazzy Jafar's stage at the upcoming DEF CON 1 festival. Tweaking in front of a golden wall, we're interrupted by Seki Seto, who perversely creeps up behind us like he's Anthony Adams. Seto tells us to locate the local law enforcement and beat the crap out of him. Only then will he grant us entry to the festival. Up first we have Sea Patrol, whom I've been eagerly wanting to meet. The Ocean Mage drops three of the four remaining Sea Serpent cards in this game. He also gives us a handy bonus in already turning his field into a C, which ironically is a negative for us because it powers up both our monsters, making me rely more heavily on equip cards for this duel. Thankfully, almost all his monsters are set as Neptune, which is weak to Spike Cedro's Pluto sign, which gives us a handy 500 attack point boost for every turn. 
Bringing our attention back to his drop table, the three Sea Serpent cards I mentioned earlier have horrible drop rates, with the highest being 2.5% and the lowest being 0.1%. On top of that, they require either an S or an A power rank, which we haven't actually pulled off for the entirety of this playthrough. It is safe to say I have my work cut out for me. I might genuinely have to resort to farming cards for card passwords. We'll see when we get to free door where we end up. Anyways. We win, and he drops Needle Ball. See, after all that, that was only a B power. Not good. Keeping the momentum going, I decide to challenge Sekmenton as is before I start grinding for cards. Sekmenton unloyingly doesn't drop any Sea Serpents despite being the freaking Coast Guard of this game. He has plenty of them in his deck however, so he's free to slap us silly whenever he feels like it. On top of that, he also carries the absolute powerhouse monster that is Crab Turtle. I hope we never meet him. As I've been talking, I've realized I've been getting my butt absolutely handed to me, but the game rewards me with a spike seeder to take out his seven colored fish. Great card. When I do a fish run, that is definitely going to be the staple of my deck. Similar strategy to the Lesser Mage, keeping our Guardian Star as Pluto defends us from his hard hitters. It has a negative effect on us as well. Each time he sets Boulder Tortoise face down, its default is Uranus, and Uranus is stronger than Pluto. Anyone that's ever played a twin head would know this. Oh hey, Raigeki for the win. We haven't done that in a while. We win, and we get Mars Sorcerer. Defeating Sekmenton with still his life preserver. Mine. Good luck, buddy. Now I need to stop and grind for cards. I am nowhere near strong enough to take out any of the other mages because of their field spell advantages. I got bodied by Meadow Mage before I even saw Kapura. Now this grind is going to be an absolute horror fest due to the random nature of my deck. In order to get an S or A rank needed to get the cards I want, I need to draw a perfect card three turns in a row, Otherwise, I'll almost end the duel on a B rank. As you're aware, all the matches in Free Duel are on neutral fields. This means that all the lower mages will almost always change the field on turn 1, leaving them open for an attack come the second turn. With this information in mind, let's cut over to Sarah, who can explain the events needed to get an S or A rank. I hope you enjoy playing this game, because it looks like you'll be repeating this a few times. You'll need to draw a Spike Seedra on turn 1, have the Ocean Mage use Umi on turn 2, Draw another Spike Seedra on turn 3, both attacking for 4,200 life points, and lastly, drawing your third Spike Seedra on turn 5. All of this must be done whilst ensuring the following. You use no more than 32 cards, stay over 7,000 life points, and not exceed 8 turns of play. Alternatively, you could win 28 matches to have enough star chips to buy your next monster. This sounds like it's going to take a while. So let's cut back to Jono, who's truly been at this for a number of hours. Five hours and 151 duels later, counting only the times I didn't rage quit, we find enough star chips to redeem attack Raminos from the card password screen. Ocean Mage dropped Kairiushin on duel 27, Aqua Dragon on duel 90, and finally Sea King Dragon on duel 135. Putting them all together, we finally have a deck that can stand up against the mages. Back to the campaign we go. Starting off at the shrine that kicked my tushy off screen, we face off against the Meadow Mage. We can see that having more than 3 monster card in this deck makes your time in this hellhole of a game a lot more pleasant. Aqua Dragon as well is an absolute godsend of a card. I'm going to definitely need him for the final 6. Chef's kiss on this thing. Seriously, what a beast. As for Takraminos, this thing is a sponge for equip cards, but it suffers from the same problem as Urabi from our last run. Its starting attack points are too weak to beat over anything stronger than 3500 attack points on a good starting hand. Anywho, onto our last turn, we attack for game and that's low meta mage down. And we get a white dolphin, yay. Up next is the high mage of homeland security Kapura, who I'm convinced ate the last lower mage we just defeated. Anyway, Kepo the Peppo hits like a truck, so we really need to rely on our equip cards. I'm also making a conscious effort not to use Raigeki unless it's absolutely necessary. See? I listen to you people. Sometimes. Anywho, we're not having as much of a bad time against Kapura than what we did on our dinosaur run. I guess we got a little bit more luck with our RNG this time. Old Mate also learnt from his mistakes last run and decided to attack a monster with a stronger Ciaru instead of a weaker one. So you know, progress there. Either way, Aqua Dragon makes quick work of things, which takes us down to our last turn where we pop an Umi and attack for game. One with Aqua Dragon and one with Kariushin. There we go, and we get Komori Dragon. We steal Kapura's Surveillance Eye, which I'm equally intrigued and disgusted as to where he might keep it. With two mages down, we're now able to face Seto too. 
But first we need to take down the Labyrinth Mage who still hasn't figured out the location of his facial features. In a big brain play, I completely forgot that the Labyrinth Mage's deck consists purely of Aqua Cards and monsters geared into making Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon. The Umi I dropped works to our disadvantage, since as you saw on turn 1, I basically bricked. So this guy is going to absolutely punish me. And unfortunately, my slippery Sea Serpent peeps, I don't end up beating this guy. I'm sitting here trying to do the math, but nothing I have in my hand is strong enough to take down his sewage in. My life points are also too low to survive any attack, so that Raigeki is not getting me out of this one. I'm going to have to take this one on the chin and learn from my mistake. Anyways, after Labyrinth Mage scares the ever-loving shit out of us with his face, what the hell is that? I have to restart all the way back at Kapura because this genius did not save. Replaying the entire Meadow Shrine again, we're back at the Labyrinth Mage. This guy didn't really take kindly to us attempting to re-challenge him again. He busts out a Gate Guardian on turn 1. I don't want to take any chances, so unfortunately I buckle and I use a Raigeki to speed things along. I also made sure not to set any of my monsters to a Neptune type, since both his Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon and Sangra of Thunder are defaulted to Pluto. I should put up a chart of some sort to explain the star alignments, but for now you'll just have to trust me on this one. Oh, there are two different charts by the way, one of them that's specific for Moon, Venus, Mercury and Sun, and the other one for all the other Guardian star types. It's in your instruction manual if you still kept it from the hard copy of this game. Being familiar with the star alignments will also help you predict what face down monster the opponent has placed on the field, so be sure to brush up on that. Anywho, final turn, and we get the one who hunts souls. After beating the Labyrinth Mage, we play some Egyptian DDR and make our way to the back chamber where we face off against Seto second. Jazzy Jafar laughs at us as he makes his way back to the club, and Seto gives us the same look I imagine the hotel quarantine guards gave to all the female guests staying at the Novotel Sydney. Our starting hand against Seto 2 isn't that great. I drop an Umi in preparation to boost Takramios to 4000 attack for my next turn. Looking at my equip cards, I think that it's worth mentioning for those unaware that Power of Kaishin is compatible with all Sea Serpent cards. It is this run's equivalent of Raise Body Heat from the Dinosaur playthrough. Dragon Treasure as well is also compatible with all 5 Sea Serpent cards. I believe this is because a few of them have a secret second typing, being Dragon, which is why you see cards like Spike Seedra and Sea King Dragon in Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon decks. The more you know. On to our last turn, we ignore the Raigeki and instead drop down a Spike Seedra. Attacking for game, Seto Boy awards us with a da 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 and Ansatsu, which is a fancy word for Assassin. Retreating back to the dual grounds, we now continue our assault against Mage Security. Before that, let's save our game, because I have a feeling that we might need it. Chopping our way through the forest, we're confronted by the Egypt Kong. Never thought I'd say that in the playthrough. Anyways, sidetracking our souls for a bit, I've just come to realise something. All the lower mages seem to be wearing the same attire that the high mages wore when you first encounter them in the Vast Shrine before the Mage Festival. It was hurting my brain as to why they look completely different, but I think I finally cracked it. Of course this is a fan theory on my end, but I'll take it. And hey, back to the duel. What's going on? We have three strong monsters and a weak opponent. This one is an easy duel. I'm happy. You're happy. We're happy. He's not happy. <laughs> Boosting up our Sea King Dragon, we attack for game, and we get... Da -da 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 -da, a draw bird. Not a draw lock bird, just a draw bird. Confronted by Tree Food Tom, we are now faced with another conundrum. How does this guy wipe? Does he have to unwrap himself completely each time he goes to the bathroom? Or is he like a Play-Doh Fun Factory? Anywho, in retaliation to our remarks, he drops a perfectly ultimate Great Moth on us, which is a bit of a problemo, so we're going to dark hole that away for safety. Not giving up so easily, he drops a boosted Koaga Hercules, which gets me a little bit excited for when we eventually do our insect run, because I'm really keen to see what cards we have access to. My guess is that that's probably one of those many cards that are locked away behind the pocket station, so we'll see how we go from there. Anyways, dropping an Aqua Dragon that we finally boost up to 30 something hundred attack points, we are now stronger than his Koaga Hercules and pretty much anything else he's going to drop aside of a perfect ultimate Great Moth. Noticing that I have a Raigeki in three Dark Holes, I'm choosing to ignore them, intentionally, because I don't want to make this a Raigeki only run, as you've probably seen from my last few videos. At this point I am probably going to be forced to use it because I've run out of cards in my hand. Luckily we draw Attack Romanos which we don't need, but we now have enough attack power to take him down, come the next turn. Edging our souls towards another Raigeki, and not being tempted to use it, we drop a second Takramenos, and attack him with our Aqua Dragon. 
It is there that we have one more turn left and I draw my last monster and I now have enough attack power to take this guy out for good. So attack one with Seeking Dragon, attack two with Takramenos, attack three with Takramenos, and attack four with Karyushin. Now my math is bad, so I'm still short by 150 life points, but it's not a problem. Ignoring all the right Gekkas and Dark Holes, I attack him for game, and we win. True Food Tom succumbs to our Might, and he gives us his Millennium Key. The key is also the only item that doesn't have an eye featured on it. Fun fact, don't know why they did that. Busting up against ground control, we're now faced in a duel against the embodiment of our past dinosaur self. Fortunately, with a lucky hand turn 1, we proceeded to wipe the floor with this guy. On a related note, can anyone please explain to me why Mammoth Graveyard is considered the dinosaur, but Great Mammoth of Goldfond is not? It is literally the same card, except one of them is gold. What the hell, Yu-Gi-Oh? Anywho, it's back to the game, and as you can see, we are absolutely pulverized in this guy. Attacking for the win with Spike Seedra, this bloke drops us a Larvis. Creeping through the catacombs, we are forced into a fight with Pinwheel, who has the Mask of the Virgin equipped. I say that as well because he is the weakest mage out of everyone. His strongest monster is only going to be 3000 attack, which is pretty pathetic for a high mage. Forgetting who I was up against, I attack into Mardis' Labyrinth Wall, which was a dumb move on my behalf. As for the rest of this duel, I can either Raigeki this guy into Oblivion, or play around these monsters to drop some handy trivia. Did you know, in terms of male human and female Yu-Gi-Oh card breeding, Sea King Dragon is a frickin' playing card and not a real being. Stop treating things like Sky Striker Engage, you sick people. I'm looking directly at you, Zodiac Duelist. And that concludes the trivia for this duel. Getting back to the gameplay, we are on our last turn. Nothing much Smarten does for us, so we skip all three Raigekis and attack for game. One with Aqua Dragon, and one with Sea King Dragon, and lastly with Karyushin. We win a Drooling Lizard. Yay. We also steal his scales. That's going to affect this supply run. We are now up against our last shrine, and it's the Mountain Shrine. Here we encounter Jin. I have no words. Let's get back to the duel. Despite our cards having the literal word dragon in their name, none of them get boosted by Mountain, which is a bloody rot if you ask me. Anywho, the Crimson Chin hasn't got anything to stop our boosted Sea King Dragon. Speaking of, Sea King Dragon is an OCG exclusive card. It has only come out once in Booster Pack Volume 6 in Japan. This card has not been reprinted since, nor made available in the TCG. With that trivia bit aside, we're now onto our final turn against the Mountain Mage. We summon Karyushin, attack with Sea King Dragon, and attack with Aqua Dragon for game. And this bloke drops an Ancient Jar. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll stop. Our final Mage match is against Ranger Beard, who at least had the decency to cover his ginormous chin. I think I understand why he sent the other bloke outside. Starting off in turn 1, I changed the field to Umi to try and bait him into not summoning a monster. This worked. Unfortunately, we do not get too good of a draw, and we're immediately overpowered by his dragons. I'm starting to get a little bit concerned because I haven't saved my game since the Forest Mage, and I truly don't have the energy to retackle every single mage tonight. I'm a bit tired, guys. <laughs> Anywho, I brick another hand, and I'm hoping that he doesn't punish me too severely. He summons a twin head, which is not good for me leaving my life points at something pretty beatable. I'm going to have to give in and use a Dark Hole just to survive this round. Thankfully, he doesn't retaliate with anything too powerful, instead leaving another face-down equipped card. Oh uh, yeah, I was reminded in the comments that when an opponent grays out a face-down card, it's an equipped card. If they don't, it's a trap. Thank you, you awesome people, for reminding me of this. On to the final turn, we attack with Aqua Dragon, and that's game. Having defeated the Tenza, we steal his compass and leave him stranded on the mountain. Seki Soto sneaks up behind us and compliments our achievement in destabilizing the local order of the kingdom. Thanks, buddy. He then offers us backstage access to the upcoming festival being opened at the Fast Shrine to make amends for kicking us out of the VIP suite at the start of the game. What a champ. Entering the club, we're approached by the resident go-go dancers, Candy Croc and Busty Birdman, who want to take turns thrashing me on a table. In a card game, of course. Now this is where we truly test the current build of our deck. Our current list is missing key staples dropped from S-taking opponents, such as Megamorph, Bright Castle, Dion Kerto, Crush Card, and Widespread Ruin, just to name a few. Each time I run this gauntlet, I try to get as far as I can with an ungrinded deck, giving the monster type we've selected as much of a chance as possible to beat the game before we give ourselves a handicap. In the case of our first match against Sebek, we seem to win without much problem. Happy days. I guess that's given that the strongest monster they can throw at us is only 3000 attack points. So with Candy Croc down, it's on to Busty Birdie. We have a very mixed run against the final six. Some of the duels we will win first try, 
Others will require a number of repeats since we're at the mercy of RNG. This is how everything went down. I can say that we win every single tool against Sebek, hands down, no issues. Neko on the other hand, well, I'll let this duel speak for itself. Long story short, we don't draw the right combination of equip cards to monster cards, giving us the first loss against the Gauntlet against Neku. I'll just jump cut to the end. Despite having a Raigeki and a Dark Hole, we're only left with 1700 life points, so no matter what we do, anything he summons after that will defeat us. So we just have to cop it and lose to a Dark Condition. That is loss number one, against Neku. And this is how the rest of everything went. We re-face off against Busty Birdman, only this time we draw better cards. We end up steamrolling him, like his crocodile counterpart. But, not to celebrate too early, we jump straight into a duel with Haishin, who overpowers us in duel 1, Raigeki bombs the absolute heck out of us in duel 2, and slaps our sit Shili in duel 3. Oh, and for the three times we magically fluked it past Haishin, Seto 3 graded us with a Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, a regular Blue Eyes, and a Media Black Dragon. Initially for this run, I was confident that we could beat the game without relying on Mega Morph, but alas, we need to go back and grind for some cards. Like our last playthrough, to make our deck ready for S-Tech, we need to obtain three copies of Widespread Ruin, Acid Trap Hole, and Fake Trap. Using the S-Tech win formula, we win Dion Keter from Mountain Mage, and go on to get a Bright Castle and a Mega Morph from Pegasus. He also dropped us a Crush card in between those, which is pretty handy. With all those cards in hand, we construct our final deck. It's the same as last time, only with Dark Hole and every non-universal equip card being removed and replaced with our new drops. Let's jump straight back into that gauntlet, hopefully for the last time. Our first duel against Candy Croc Sebek is a breeze. I want to give a shout out to Darkrai1276 for giving me the tip that the AI will not grey out trap cards before ending their turn. This is going to be really useful for us later when we're trying to navigate around Widespread Ruin. So thanks mate, you're an absolute legend. Anywho, all we need to finish this duel is a monster over 3000 attack. Sebs has no traps or spell cards to counter us, so it's honestly a pretty easy win for the C team. I think we should come up with a better name for ourselves. I'm gonna go with the Seaman. Hell yeah, shout out to the Seaman. Anywho, we attack for game, and that's Sebek down. We win a Zanki. Handy. On to Busty Birdman. He usually gives me trouble in the form of a dead hand. It's almost like the main defense of these AI opponents is to intentionally brick your starting hands. You've probably noticed that I've been leaving myself open for the last few duels, opting to use an Umi each time I fight an opponent on a dark field. This is done intentionally. I'm trying to bait the AI into changing the field back to dark so I can have a free shot against their life points. This is the same principle we employ against the mages, but the final six are sometimes smart enough to not always fall for it. Thankfully in this case, he did. Though he drops a problematic dark magician, like I said, anything over 3000 attack points is enough to beat this guy. And there we go. We won a Horn Imp. Having taken out the resident Go-Go dancers, DJ Jazzy Jafar confronts us, being noticeably pissed off that he hasn't made headliner at MageCon 1. That's MageCon 1 spelt with a Q. The game throws us a massive bone, and grants us probably one of the strongest hands I can hope to pull off this run. From losing to this guy three times before, we wipe the absolute floor with him as some sweet payback. That's what he gets for using Raigeki against us. Who does he think he is? Me? Anywho, with the final turn at hand, we summon our last Sea Serpent and attack him for game. Boom. Boom. Game. And we get a Rogue Doll. Nice. In his defeat, Jafar scares us and several small children with his creepy face. Seki Seto escorts us to the main stage after confiscating Jafar's magic stick. Unbeknownst to us, Seto approaches the tweaking wall and uncovers a secret Mosha in it downstairs. Seto then reveals his plan to us of wanting to shut down Mage Con 1 and sets his sights on us to finish the job. With our newly improved deck, Seto 3 should be an absolute cakewalk for us, right? Right? Ah, oh, crap. Ah, oh, crap is definitely an understatement because we managed to get all the way back to Seto only to have him wipe the floor with us again. In our third push, we finally get a final 6 cycle where Seto 3 summons Gate Guardian on turn 1 instead of Blue-Eyes Ultimate Dragon. Each time I've had a good run at this game, regardless of the playthrough, it's always been a cycle where Seto 3 does not summon Ultimate Dragon on turn 1. Of course, an opponent like this showcases why everyone tends to run Media Black Dragon for the final six. It's a necessity. You'd only need three equip cards to be able to hit over an Ultimate Dragon. In our case, we'd need a starting hand of about four equip cards, with one of those being a Mega Morph, and the last monster in our hand being an Aqua Dragon or even a Sea King Dragon. That's the minimum we need to hit over an Ultimate Dragon. Fortunately, we get lucky that he summons a Gate Guardian, so I only need half of those resources to make a difference. You've probably noticed that I have two Raigeki in my hand. I'm not going to use them. 
My Aqua Dragon is stronger than any Ultimate Dragon he can summon, so I'm not going to use those cards as a crutch. But, in the interest of time, I'm just going to blow up his field given that Aqua Dragon's at 5,000 attack points. And we win! A Gorgon Egg! That's Seto 3 down. Sneaking into the Mosh Pit, Jazzy Jafar threatens to murder our enemy if we don't hand over the items. I can't see a problem with this, but the game mandates that I comply with his requests. Jazzy Jafar summons forth a deity, who he then greets with a racial slur. The deity affectionately turns him into a card and then sets him on fire. See, some problems solve themselves. With his sights trained on us, he makes an attempt to banish us from the mosh pit, but we showcase to him that we've been granted audience thanks to our VRP passes, so instead he challenges us to a card game. Dark Knight is fortunately a much easier opponent for us. Our main threat is his media Black Dragon, which fortunately is weak to the Neptune Guardian Star. As long as we have two equipped cards and a Seeking Dragon, he won't attack us for game. That being said, he also has Black Skull Dragon, so we need to be careful of that. In the hand that I've bricked, I decide to put down a face down to bait out a Harpy's Feather Duster, in an attempt to buy more time before I draw a monster. Thankfully, I get one, so we fuse our two Dion Ketters into a Megamorph, and boost ourselves down a Seeking Dragon. Knowing that Dark Knight also has widespread ruin in his deck, I send down a Sacrificial Aqua Dragon to pop whatever trap card he has set for us. Fortunately, it was nothing. Being paranoid about my mathematic skills, I power up a Spike Seedra instead of going for a Raigeki, even though I know I could have won with that. But anywho, it doesn't matter, we attack the game and down goes Dark Knight. With a bunch of rumbling and the screen fading to white, the deity reveals himself to be none other than Saint Anger, a villainous enemy, fitting for the final boss. I draw a lucky hand in turn 1. Though it's not enough to reach 4500 attack points, Seeking Dragon's Mercury Guardian Star ensures I have an attack tie with Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, given that it's the faultless sun. Very handy. Unfortunately, our next hand is a flop, so I opt to leave a sacrificial monster in defense mode to bait out an attack from something weaker on his end. I use the term weaker loosely, given that it's a gate guardian of all things. I'm also hoping that the AI doesn't sacrifice his ultimate dragon against my monster, otherwise it's game over for us. So not taking any chances, I'll take the pity Raigeki and wipe the field so I can start attacking for some serious damage. We're fortunate that his next card isn't a blue eyes ultimate dragon, instead he opts for a twin head. Unfortunately on our end, our hand is a bit shallow of equipped cards, but that shouldn't worry us given that he's only on a thousand life points. Getting to the home stretch, I'm saddened that we didn't draw a spike seed on our final turn, but nonetheless, I beef up my Aqua Dragon with a Mega Morph and a Bright Castle, we attack our Black Skull Dragon, and we attack him with Seeking Dragon for game. That is it. We get some ice water, and Saint Anger has been banished. Play that victory track because we've freaking earned it. So in short, yes, you can beat Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories with a Sea Serpent only deck, provided you have a pocket station from Japan. Hey everyone, Jono here. Thank you all so much for making it to the end of this video. I have been absolutely blown away by your comments on my last clip. I hit over a thousand subscribers and a hundred thousand views thanks to you amazing people. I never ever thought that was going to be possible. I also want to give a massive thank you to Sarah for joining me on this video to cover the mechanic explanations. Well, thank you for having me, and you are most welcome. I want to thank everybody for watching and supporting this channel. This is my first time recording, so I hope you all enjoyed it. And who knows, you might hear more from me again in future clips. So be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon to be notified for the next entry. As for our next run, comment below on what you'd like to see next. Insect has been a popular suggestion, so get your comments in before I make a start on that. So until then, stay awesome people, and I'll catch you next time.